Hey, today we're continuing, we're beginning a new sermon series on Dinner with Jesus. Uh, I don't know about you, but this takes me back to thinking about dinners at my house now and in the past. I grew up in a family with eight brothers and sisters, so dinner for us was an exciting time. Uh, you know, my mom would spend a considerable amount of time getting food ready. Uh, I remember we would say prayer, and as soon as we were done, they immediately we'd grab for the bread because she typically didn't put out enough for all of us. We'd have to go get the second batch, and you had to do it if you were the one who wanted the bread then. So, we'd... And uh, I sat between two of my brothers. I remember vividly this. My brothers, at some time during the dinner, would say roller derby, and then they would rock their chairs and try to squish me in the middle. And I would either pitch forward to try to dodge them or pitch backwards into the wall uh, uh, so that they would crash into each other. Most of the time, they got me. But uh, then my mother would always say, boys, stop that. <laughs> and then we would. But it was a fun time, right? So I'm sure a lot of you have fun dinner memories of your families. I remember when our kids were there, one of the rules we had was we ate meals together. And of course, that's a significant thing about how families come together, how you eat and uh, share things together. And I've got to say now that with our kids gone, Dinners are a little lonely when it's just me and Joy or just one of, the, one of us by ourselves. It's a different kind of thing, and cooking's really different. Uh, I find myself now preparing all these meals. You know, I cook the same amount, but now I'm freezing it in these little sections. And we could go a long time just eating out of the freezer now, right? With all those little meals that are there. I will say that one of the things we're going to learn is, in this course is that who we eat with makes a difference. In the Jewish faith, meals uh, had, of course, a sacred significance. Every meal began after ritual wash with prayer. Uh, meals were done, uh, they were supposed to keep kosher. That meant they ate only certain foods prepared in certain ways. They weren't supposed to eat with Gentiles, that is, non-believers, and they weren't supposed to eat with people who had been identified as sinners, right? Those people could make you unclean or drag you down, and you were called to be a holy people, so they felt that this was wrong. We're going to see Jesus take the opposite approach. Mealtimes for him were an invitation, uh, an opportunity for an invitation to the last, the least, and the lost. We see him eating not only with his disciples, but also with the very people that had been defined as outside the group, uh, sinners and prostitutes and others. We're going to see him reaching out with the gospel good news. Everyone was welcome. He made meal fellowship an important outreach, a symbol of the sweeping grace of the kingdom of God. And we're going to learn a lot, I think, from these meals, uh, because each one is a lesson in love and in welcome. And at that time, Jesus was also used the opportunities of these meals to give teachings. So we're going to see him teaching. We're going to see him give some harsh words, some hopeful words. So we're going to see him challenge a lot of the people that he's eating with. And I mentioned that he ate with tax collectors and sinners, but he also ate, we're going to see a surprising number of times, with Pharisees, right, and scribes. In other words, leaders of the church. So you get this incredible mixture of different types of people eating together. And there's kind of a lesson there for what the church maybe should be. Uh, when we eat with Jesus, we are, of course, thinking, of course, as the, uh, uh, the Last Supper, uh, the outreach that he had there. As we, see, uh, as we share in these meals with Jesus, we'll see sins disappear in grace, people growing in faith, and people becoming family. And, of course, there is this. Jesus also pointed to a heavenly banquet that was to come, a messianic banquet. And that's one of my favorite images for, the, for, for heaven, is this idea that we're all eating together. That, to me, speaks more powerfully than streets of gold and pearly gates, right? That idea of meal fellowship and celebration coming together. Well, who we eat with makes a difference. So I'm going to throw this out to you. Who do you eat with? Right? Asking you to just shake it up a little bit. Who do you eat with? I see you pointing at Roger, Julie. Okay, he's the one you eat with. Anybody else? I mean, do you eat just with the, just, just the people every time? Who do you eat with? Anybody? Raise your hand. Who do you eat with? Family and friends. And that's almost a definition of friendship, right? Who you eat with? Uh, my folks lived in a small town, Grantsburg, Wisconsin, and they got the newspaper from their town for decades after they left the town. And I'm telling you, there was a whole page of who ate Sunday dinner with whom, right? Did any of you come from a town that small? I told, I told somebody that this week, and they said, there's no town that small. That, that town was that small. Who you ate with made a difference. Anybody else? Who do you eat with? Just, yeah, Rudy, who do you eat with? I'm not ashamed to admit this, but uh, I eat with Fox News TV. 
<laughs> Even the TV, okay. We had a dog that used to always, when we sat down to eat, the food was out all the time, but that's the time she chose to eat because, you know, it's family time, <laughs> time to snarf down. Okay. So we're going to look at meals with Jesus, and we're going to look at uh, I, one of the first ones. We're not going to look at everyone because this was interesting too. Uh, I was reading a commentary written 20 years ago on this topic, and almost the first thing I read getting ready for this series was, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is all, it seems like Jesus is always either going to or coming from a meal. And really, he goes to a lot of meals in the Gospel of Luke. Once you start reading through the Gospel, and that way you'll see it come up a lot. Well, we're going to look at Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 27. It starts off this way. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. So after this, after what? Well, it's after he has uh, called the very first disciples around the Sea of Galilee. That's where all this story is taking place. And it's directly after he has healed the paralytic. You remember that story? Uh, Jesus is teaching in a, in a house, and there's so many people that people can't get in. So there's people who bring in a friend of theirs who is crippled, a paralytic. And because they can't reach Jesus, they rip a hole in the roof and lower him down. And Jesus heals him, and he says these words, Arise, take up your pallet, and walk. All right? Powerful story. Right after that, Jesus leaves that house, apparently, and he sees this tax booth. And he sees a tax collector named Levi there. Now, Levi is almost certainly the one who's identified in the Gospel of Matthew as Matthew, the same person, and one of the 12. He's going to become a, a critical figure in, in, uh, uh, in the Gospel story. He's a tax collector. Well, there are tax collectors. Well, are they popular today? T collecting taxes isn't. What do we say? Taxation without representation is tyranny. Taxation with representation isn't so hot either, right? Uh, none of us are crazy about getting taxed, but in their day, taxation was different. Of course, they're under Roman authority, so there's this occupying power that is taking the taxes. And they take taxes in two ways. There's, first of all, a tax that they themselves administer that's basically simple and easy. And that's to go over things like a poll tax, which is you're a human being, so you pay this amount of money. That's an obvious one. And the other one is land taxes. If you own property, they will tax you so much. So the Romans administer those, but the rest of the taxes, tolls, tariffs, customs, are done by tax farming. This is a horrible system that the Romans practice that as soon as you hear about it, you go, well, that sounds like it's going to cause all kinds of problems. And it did. It was simple for the Romans. That's why they did it. So the Romans would do this. They would say, we want to collect X amount of money from the city of Eagle. We want to get $10 million from Eagle. So who wants to be the tax farmer for this area? And then people would put in bids, and they would either pay the money up front, or in some occasions they were allowed to pay the money as they went. But essentially, they're responsible then for collecting the money. What does this lead to? Well, it leads to a couple of things. First of all, if you're the tax farmer, any money you, collect, you have to collect, at least the amount you're paying, right? And anything you get over that is gravy. So what does it mean? You're going to gouge every cent you possibly can out of everybody that comes by. So it leads itself to really strict administration of the taxes. And it also leads to uh, gouging. Here's what I mean. Since they're doing customs and tariffs, a lot of it's based on people traveling through an area. If you're traveling through the area and you've got cabbages you're taking to market, and I say, oh, I think that's now... $500 instead of the 50 it was last week, you know, what are you going to do? You have, a limit, you have a perishable product that has to get to market soon or you're going to lose value. So people were often gouged in various ways. So tax collectors were hated. They were hated because they were almost always corrupt, gouging people and taking advantage of them and administering the taxes in a bad way, but also they were collaborators with the Roman government, the occupying power. So people hated them, and they were forbade to go do things like go to synagogue. These were people that were publicly identified as being evil. <laughs> they can't come to worship here. That would be the way they would be treated. Right? So when he says, says he's a tax collector, this is a guy who most people are shunning and avoiding. If any of you have watched The Chosen... You see there, Matthew is what? His family won't have anything to do with him. He can't worship God in the synagogue. He's cut off from all kinds of resources. So there's this tax collector named Levi sitting in his tax booth. So he's doing his work, his job, 
And Jesus comes up and he says, follow me, Jesus said to him. So that's what we get, follow me. Now that's all Jesus says here in the Gospel of Luke. Had he met him before? Had he had a lot of conversations with him? Has Levi snuck in the back to listen to Jesus talk? We don't know. Uh, Maybe that happened. I was talking with people this week, and one person said to me, he said, well, this is Jesus. He has this charisma. He has this magnetism. He just says, follow me, and people follow him. Could be. I guess I've always imagined that there was more to the story, that he had met him, heard him, whatever. But this follow me is interesting, right? A disciple is a person who is a student, but also a follower, one who walks in the footsteps of their master or their Lord. So he is really saying, come be my disciple. And that's a call to a different lifestyle than Levi has been living. Radically different, right? And what does it say about him? Jesus says, follow me, verse 28, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Now, the word for got up is a rose. It's the same word that was used to the paralytic in the last story, right? Rise, take up your pallet, and follow after me. Rise, get up from where you were. Get up from your sins. Get up from where, uh, what has been holding you back. Get up, leave everything, and follow me. And leave everything, it says, abandon. Abandon it. Now, that must mean in a certain sense. It's not going to have the priority in his life because the very next thing he's doing is throwing a dinner party, which must involve the resources he's had. But he's going to leave everything behind and go in a different direction and follow Jesus. Verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. So a great banquet. We don't know what that could mean. Uh, we do know that rich people would often have houses with courtyards and that they would have a dining area. And weirdly, this is so weird to us because when we have fancy houses today, people want privacy. When people had fancy houses in the ancient world, it was sort of an invitation for them to be looked at and envied. So they'd often, really rich people had courtyards and typically people could actually go in the courtyard to watch what was going on. It was like entertainment in the ancient world. Let's go see who they're, what they're eating and who they're eating with and the fancy things that are going on, and we could listen. And think of uh, uh, Jesus, remember, when he was on trial at the house of the high priest, and there are all these people in the courtyard who are doing business there. Then, you know, Peter's there with others. That's what you could do. You could go in that courtyard and kind of hang out while the big things are happening there. So maybe this is a crowd watching this. There's a great banquet a feast going on. And who does this guy invite? Well, he invites the people he knows. And we know that's typically true. When somebody becomes a Christian, you know what the first thing they do is? They often invite people they know, tend to be people like them. So he throws this great banquet, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. Now, often it says tax collectors and sinners, right? That'll be a phrase that's going to be used later on. But they call in their friends. He calls in his friends, and they're all eating there together. And so this is a group that normally Jews, just an ordinary Jew, would not eat with. And yet Jesus is going to go eat with them. This is going to create comment. Uh, The Pharisees and spiritual leaders of the day are, are going to question this. Why is he doing this? Does he either not know who these people are, or knowing who they are, does he just not care? He's associating with sinners. Now, do we care about that today? Who do we eat with, right? Most of us eat with family and friends, and we identify them in that way. But we do sometimes raise questions about people who eat dinner. You know, if a politician's eating dinner with these type people, maybe that's not a good sign. If an entertainer is hired by a a dictator to come do a a, a sing at their dinner, uh, their birthday celebration, that's not a good thing, right? We care about that. Who people eat with may matter to us depending upon the context. So they see Jesus doing this, and they're upset. And that's what it says, verse 30. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law, it originally said scribes, and you remember that people wrote down, copied the scriptures. They would write them down and then they would teach on them. So that's why they're called teachers of the law, sometimes lawyers because they're teaching the law, all right? Uh, The law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you doing this? What's the point? What's the purpose? So these Pharisees, who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees are a group of people who committed themselves to obeying the law as closely and as strictly as they could. Their numbers varied. 
we think that they were never less than 1,500 and never more than about 5,000. So a small number. They are looked on as kind of the spiritual elite. These are people who are really committed to the faith. Uh, we know that they, they saw themselves that way. We're really focused on this. Who are some famous Pharisees that we can think of in the Bible? Well, Nicodemus, right? We think of the story of Jesus encountering him. Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his tomb as a burial place. The Apostle Paul was a member of that group. Uh, there are others that are mentioned, Gamaliel and a few others, but play a less prominent role. Several of these Pharisees do become Christians, right? And we'll talk more about the Pharisees as we go through these, this series because, of course, they come up in a lot of the dinners. They're often there. So they ask this question, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And if you're like me, you're wondering, how do they know these other people are sinners? What did they do? You know, the, the common thing has been, been to just say, well, they're all prostitutes, but that doesn't seem likely for the tax collectors to be doing that. We don't know why. Uh, what these people had done, or why they're perceived that way. Maybe it's just their association with tax collectors. We don't know. But why do you do this? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now that's so true, isn't it? I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to go in for that yearly checkup when I'm feeling fine. Uh, what's the point? You know, I need a doctor when I'm sick, not when I'm healthy. And if you're like me when you're, you're feeling ill, well, when COVID was going on, wasn't it upsetting to a lot of us not to be able to go to the doctor? <laughs> you know, sorry, you might be sick. Don't come. That's the point. That's why I have you, right? I, uh, I, anyhow, but I understand there were medical. I don't mean to, I'll get, I'll get in trouble with my wife who's a nurse in a minute here. Uh, uh, we all kind of experience that. We, we want help when we're ill. So Jesus is raising this issue. These are people who are spiritually sick. Now, is he saying they alone are spiritually sick? Let's think about what he says next. He says, uh, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus comes to call sinners to repentance. So that raises the issue. You know, are the Pharisees righteous? What does it mean to be righteous? To be righteous means to have a right relationship with God and with others. It's about our relationship. Do the Pharisees have that? We look into them and go, huh, probably not. They're upset that Jesus is reaching out, that God is reaching out to people with problems. They're upset that God's grace is going out to people they don't want in their list. You know, we want to be in charge of this and control it. So it raises an issue for us about who's in and who's out of the kingdom. And it says that the standards the world has are often wrong. I'll tell you, there's a couple stories after this I just want to lift up for you, a little passage after. We're not going to be looking at it in depth. But the next thing is, it says to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. You know, we fast, we, take, you know, we, we deprive ourselves, and you guys are always eating and drinking. What's that about? And Jesus says, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. What he's really saying here is, this is a time for celebration. And that's one of the big issues that comes up in the church. How often do we celebrate? What do we celebrate? When should we repent? And how much is fasting, you know, depriving ourselves a part of and sacrifice a part of worship? How much is celebration? I worked with a guy in Connecticut who celebrated, he was a pastor. He believed that every week we should celebrate. And he said the biggest problem churches have today is they don't celebrate enough. There are all these things we can and should be celebrating. And I'll tell you, every week we celebrated something. In a certain sense, it got old for me. But I get his point, right? A lot of our churches, we don't celebrate enough. There are things we should be celebrating. You know, shawls made, wheelchairs that are given, things that are going on in your lives, right? We should be celebrating those things and lifting them up to God. And then he goes on to talk about old wine and new wine and wineskins. And he's just saying something new and revolutionary is happening in Jesus that we, that we need to have made available. The old ways can't hold. I'm just lifting that up because it's going to keep coming up, those themes, as we look at other meals with Jesus. Well, what do I want us to get from today's passage? First of all, I hope you hear that word arise. You know, rise. He, he, you know, he, he changed his life. He rose in a new way, and he rose out of his sins. That speaks to me, uh, especially because of our church's involvement with the free wheelchair mission. 
you know, one of their things is to say that we lift people up off the ground in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's, of course, a powerful physical way that we lift people off, by giving them a wheelchair. But it also just reminds me of where we all come from spiritually. We all of us are, you know, crawling on the ground in the need of help and a Savior. And our Lord is reaching out with his hands to lift us up. You know, Levi sees that, he rises just like the paralytic. And I think we want to rise in the same way to know God's grace in our lives. He followed. He was a disciple who abandoned or left behind everything that he had in order to follow Jesus, which just tells us about the value Jesus had. You know, this is a guy who, in a sense, sold himself out for money. And he realizes that that's, that's wrong. And he leaves all that money that he had sold himself out for behind so he can find himself and, and find his Savior. I think that's a powerful message for us to learn. Uh, and then it raises the whole issue of who Jesus calls. Isn't he an interesting choice? He doesn't call the people you'd think. He doesn't go find the top scholars in the area. He doesn't go find the best Pharisees. He instead called a bunch of fishermen earlier, and now his, right after the first few fishermen, he chooses a tax collector. Now, I will tell you that most people would look at that and go, that's not going to be a good team. How are these people going to come together? You know, uh, fishermen, the, an odd choice to begin with, and now you've got a guy who's a collaborator in a, a grotesque center. You're going to have them work together? How's that going to work? How's that going to happen? Who does Jesus call today? Well, he calls people like you and me, right? He calls everybody, we believe. And the question is whether or not they will respond, whether we will respond to that call of God in Christ Jesus. Are we going to listen and follow? And it tells us that we come together as a body. Boy, we, we have to recognize that we're not all the same. But that's a problem. Churches tend to, like Levi, what did he do? He called the tax collectors and sinners that he knew. We gather people that are like-minded. In fact, it's been said that the most segregated time in America is 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Uh, you know, because we tend to get people who are alike in the same place. Um, when I was in Connecticut, that was really true for me in the, the town I, I was in. They were, they were, every church was really not only a church, but an ethnic body, right? So there, was, uh, there were three Catholic churches. There was one for the Portuguese. I'm not making this up. There was one for uh, the other Latinos, and there was one for the European uh, Catholics. You know, that's what it was. Uh, there was a black church in town. There was, you know, all these different ethnic groups in town. Uh, so what does that say? And what kind of... The church should be a place where different types of people come together. Uh, and that's what we see modeled by Jesus. And we see Levi inviting all his friends. And you wonder what that invitation was like. Come and meet Jesus. Come and see the, the Savior who's called me. Uh, just come to dinner. I don't know uh, how this uh, meal worked out. And we see Jesus reaching out uh, to sinners. And you know, Somebody this week when I was meeting with them said Jesus was into networking. I don't know if that's true, but uh, it's a funny way of thinking about it. But he's meeting with these others, and he's willing to throw a celebration. And boy, I'm just intrigued by that whole idea of celebration as a part of worship. You know, we Christians have a reputation for being sour and dour and, you know, uh, uh, prudish. You know, the idea here is that Jesus is, is celebrating with people, bringing them together. What are our celebrations look like? What are they, uh, ha how are they happening? Jesus is meeting other people. And uh, he's eating with, Fer eating with Pharisees, or at least they're able to comment. We're going to see him eating a lot with Pharisees. And that raises an interesting issue for how we view them. Oftentimes in the church, we view the Pharisees as kind of the enemies of God or the enemies of Jesus. When I was in seminary, one of my professors said, don't look at the Pharisees that way, right? The Pharisees are really the religious leaders of uh, the people of Jesus' day. Uh, uh, and he said, they're people Jesus loved and cared about. Several of them do become disciples of his, right, and followers. He said, and actually, if you think of them as the religious leaders, who do they most closely resemble? Well, us, right? Specifically, religious leaders. If you're a religious leader, the Pharisees kind of resemble you. So when we read their story, we should be saying, is this my story? In what way do I resemble the Pharisees? Is this a challenging word for me to hear and apply? And I hope you do that. Uh, you know, the Pharisees are saying, don't eat with these people. Don't associate with them. Who are we willing to associate with and why? Are we ever closing doors? Do we want only people that are like us? Right? That's a big question for us to deal with. And, of course, the Pharisees are certainly 
self-righteous, you know? Uh, there's a judgment thing that's going on. They feel that eating with these people is shameful and uh, 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 not the way it should be taking place. Um, it raises an issue for us, you know, who we're willing to associate. I, I've shared this before, but a friend of mine uh, was hired, uh, uh, my roommate actually last year at the seminary, he was hired by Maxie Dunham, some of you have heard of him, one of the famous preachers in Methodism in the last, oh, 50 years. And he was hired to be the mission worker there, you know, be ahead of their mission ministries. And one of the things they did under his tenure was they started doing a dinner uh, at the church for uh, homeless people and needy people in the community. And their church was ideally so located for this, so they had this massive meal. And they'd often get people afterwards, they'd do other services for them there. And this was quite controversial because they had a big, beautiful church that had traditionally been in a really ritzy part of town. And, you know, through urban blight, people had left, but they were still coming in for this. And uh, people were not happy. And there was one woman who went up to Maxie Dunham and she said, she said, I'm just, I don't know what to say about this. We got all these people wandering around our church who just don't belong here. And, uh, you know, why, you know what, what, why are we doing this? Why are, why are we reaching out in this way? It makes me feel less safe. It makes me feel just not as good about our church. And Maxie Dunham said, we're doing this because there are sinners that need to be saved from hell. And she said, well, that's probably true. Probably some of them might not encounter Jesus if it weren't for us. And Maxie Dunham said, I'm not talking about them. <laughs> Great line, right? Uh, but you think of that. Who, who's being saved here? The Pharisees need to be in touch with these people. They're exactly the people they should be reaching out to, but they're unable to do that. Are we willing to do that? Where's our comfort zone in our ministry? What are we willing to do? Who are we willing to reach out to? And what are we willing to do to help people encounter the living God? And I will say this. Uh, some people look at this and they say, well, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I'm always a little worried about that because we're not Jesus, right? Uh, we bring out, you know, we're not the physician, the great physician. We're bringing the great physician to people, right? Uh, uh, we're trying to share that. And at best, we're sick physicians, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, with all our ailments and sins and problems and weaknesses. Who are we to reach out to other folks in the, that way? Certainly not with the idea of we're giving salvation, but rather we're going to do our best to share what we know and also receive what we need from the people around us. Well, a lot of things to think about there about leaving your comfort zone. Is that our job to leave our comfort zone? I would say that it really is. Uh, and I'll give that an emphatic yes. We need to leave our comfort zone and learn how to reach out to people around us so uh, in ways that, that, that can share the gospel. I think too often we, well, you know, we come to church and we visit with the people we know instead of reaching out to somebody who's a guest or a visitor. We do ministries that we feel safe and comfortable with. But a lot of times there's a need for us to stretch out and to expand and to try new things in new ways. So I'm going to give that an emphatic yes and say, what could some of those be for you? Some people here would be teaching Sunday school for, for kids, right? That's outside of your comfort zone. For others, it might be doing some ministry or service. We have the homeless dinners. You know, for years we had too many volunteers for them. After COVID, we all kind of got out of the habit. We need more volunteers to serve at the homeless dinner. So, hey, do that. Baking angels, we need them for making the cookies for the homeless dinners that we do, right? So those are all areas where you could do it, different ways. And I will tell you, you know, we do prison ministry. We do other outreaches that people could be involved with. But they're all of us have a comfort zone. Some of us have a small one. <laughs> Some of us have a bigger one. I always think of myself as having a bigger one, but I'll tell you, there are times when I get my comfort zone challenged. A few years ago, I was... Uh, uh, doing prison ministry with uh, uh, our Kairos team, and I, I was in there, and because I'm clergy, people often will take an advantage, uh, that, that they're, they're invited to do this, to, to ask me to meet with them so they can talk about sins or problems they have. And there's one guy who's been involved with our ministry for years, he, uh, one of our prayer warriors there. But he never, and we never ask, we're never supposed to ask, you know, what have you done to be here, or what's going on, but this he does, he takes me aside, and he starts sharing with me about what he did, and it was horrible and disgusting. I'll just say that, you know, really. And I've heard a lot. When I'm saying that, it's, it's really bad. Uh, so he's sharing this with me, and this is a man who's been hit with illness. He's in a wheelchair. He's losing the chance. Right after this, we have a meal, and they bring out the food, and they lay it before him, and guess what? 
His hands can't hold the instruments anymore, so this is how he eats normally, like a dog. He just puts his head down and starts eating. And I'm watching that going, ugh, you know. And I said, let me help you. But now I'm feeding a guy who has just told me <laughs> truly disgusting things, right? And I, I'm struggling. This is outside of my comfort zone. I do not want to be doing this, right? Where's your comfort zone? You know, I was thinking at the time, boy, I need to be doing this even though it's hard because what am I saying? I'm on a higher spiritual plane than this guy? I don't want to be saying that. Uh, I had an idyllic childhood and life, you know. This guy had a horrible one. I can't judge this person. That's not my job. My job is to be that instrument of grace. So where's our comfort zone? What are you willing to do? Now, I said an emphatic yes, getting outside of your comfort zone, but I do want to give one little thing about that. Occasionally, we say something like that, and then people do crazy, stupid things, you know, uh, endangering themselves. We're not talking about that. Have some common sense. And we're also recognizing that not everybody's called to every ministry, or maybe not that ministry for a time. I've shared with you before about my dad. When he retired, he went to our pastor in our church and said, what can I do? And the first thing the guy gave him was visiting uh, uh, the nursing homes. And my dad tried it, and he just hated it. He said, I'm terrible at it. He says, I, that's just not me. He tried two other things, finally got his home in doing uh, an outreach to uh, Snowcap, a ministry that reached out to the poor and homeless in the community. Perfect fat, fat for him. I will say later on, though, he did end up doing that same kind of visitation work towards the end of his life. It's not you. Maybe it's not you right now. But, you know, try things. How else will you know? So that's my challenge for you this week, is to find you know, something that's outside your comfort zone, or at least be praying and thinking about what you can be doing outside your comfort zone to serve God and to encounter others, all right? That's our word. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the scripture, for the challenge it gives us to live differently. We thank you for the example Jesus gave us to reach out to those around us, the last, the least, the lost, the ones that everybody else forgets about. Even if they're rich like Levi, or even if they're poor like the other sinners, or even if they're the righteous like the Pharisees. Help us, we pray, to be instruments of your grace at all times. In Jesus' name, amen.